We are live. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Connected Learning Television. This is the fourth of four webinars uh, that are in a series titled Supporting Connected Learning Experiences in Minecraft. Uh, it's organized by Connected Camps. Uh, and if you're watching this, uh, go ahead and share it with other networks and pass it around. Uh, I'm Sean Dickers, uh, Chair of the Education Department at Bethel University, um, and a Minecraft player and lover, and a father of two Minecraft players um, and lovers of Minecraft, and uh, have taken, uh, um, uh, the, I have the privilege of working today with Bron Stuckey, uh, Denise Colby, and Stephen Islicks. And Diana um, Molashevsky might be joining us soon if she can get her technology worked out. Uh, but in the meantime, we have three educators uh, that are have worked with students and played with students and really embraced Minecraft as a as an innovative uh, learning experience um, or just a, an innovative experience to share with their students. So we're going to hear from them about how they do that today. So to those of you that are um, uh, have any questions or comments, you can send them through the Twitter hashtags uh, hashtag Connected Learning one word or um, hashtag CC. AMPS or C camps, um, and we can use that as a Q&A feature. So if you have questions, you can go ahead and send them in that way. Uh, this is also being co-streamed at the National Writing Project's Educator Innovative, EducatorInnovator.org. Um, so before we uh, begin, uh, I'd like to give everybody a chance to kind of introduce themselves and uh, just a real quick one or two liner about who you are and where you come from. So let's just kind of start with Bron and work our way across the uh, pictures. Hi everyone. Um, I work, I live and work in Sydney for the most part, but I work on global projects related to virtual world um, games and games in learning and um, most particularly Minecraft. Good. Denise? Um, I am a teacher in the TDSB, uh, Toronto District School Board in Toronto, Canada, um, and I'm currently working out of the classroom this year as a student as a student work studies teacher, so teacher researcher. Great, Steve. My name is Steve Isaacs. I teach uh, video game design and development at William Adam Middle School in Basking Ridge, and I've been using Minecraft extensively for kids to create their own games in Minecraft. Wonderful. And Diana joined us. So Diana, if you're, is your mic working? And we'll take that as a no. So <laughs> I can introduce Diana for when she comes in. That'd be great. Could you do that? Yes, Diana is a teacher librarian in the Tron District School Board. She has also extensive um, background in Minecraft, whereas um, one of the founding members along with me with Gaming Edus, and she is also the editor of the Teaching Librarian, which is a magazine publication for teacher librarians. And and the two of you work pretty closely together. So why don't we start off with your story? So tell us about what you've done and what your 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 journey has been with Minecraft. It started really just as a, a professional learning community. Diana and I connected um, through teacher librarian things and she knew our third member, Liam, who's not here today. And it started as um, an exploration of game-based learning. And Liam had been using Minecraft in beta with his spec ed class, so we decided we would spend some time focusing on game-based learning through Minecraft. And that was about four years ago. So we've been using it in clubs and in our classrooms. So. I don't know how much more you want to go into that. This, um, I've used it as a center for literacy. I've used it for um, projects. I've used it in summer school. A lot. <laughs> well, we'll unpack that a little bit. That's part yeah. of the today, but that's a great kind of umbrella kind of perspective on it. Uh, Brian, sure. you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. I was, um, well, Minecraft's not my first rodeo. I was involved for 10 years with the um, Quest Atlantis program out of Indiana University and then Arizona State University, a virtual world game for years five to eight. Um, and then I came across Minecraft and I joined with uh, my colleagues Dean Groom and Joanna Kay. Uh, here in Australia to, to work on the project Massively Minecraft, which was an out-of-school server 
for kids around the world and their parents because that was one of the conditions that parents join um, if the children were under 10. Um, and uh, we ran uh, that server for a number of years and Joe continues that work with Massively Jocadia. So that was an out-of-school project um, and we developed some pedagogy and philosophy out of that that really has propelled my interest in Minecraft these days. Currently I work in um, more in teacher development in Minecraft and curating um, the Minecraft Experience Wiki which is looking at implementations of Minecraft around the world. So it's what teachers do with it that really excites me. Um, Minecraft uh, out of the box is not near as exciting as the way teachers apply it in their classrooms. And so I'm finding really fabulous stories of implementation. Currently I'm setting up um, to do case studies in 2016 but I'm not focusing on the current exemplars, I'm focusing on schools that are stepping into the space for the first time and telling the story of how they came to Minecraft and how they get it started in their classroom schools or districts. So if there's anyone listening who would like to be involved with that, please message me. Thanks, Sean. No problem, thank you. Steve? So, you know, so I teach video game design and development and I use a variety of tools and like to give my kids choice in, in what uh, tools they use. And, you know, Minecraft, you know, you couldn't take two steps without hearing kids talk about Minecraft. And uh, I tried a few times to play and it, you know, it took me a little while or quite honestly, I didn't quite get into it right away. But my feeling was if these kids are, are so excited about, about this game, um, I have to take stock in the fact that there's something there. And so I started exploring a little, you know, becoming sort of uh, on the outskirts of some of the Minecraft educator communities, just kind of, you know, poking my head around and trying to figure some things out. And my first thought was, you know, maybe I would have kids create these adventure maps. I heard of these adventure maps and that that would be a project. And then fortunately, um, thanks to people like like Bron and, and Marianne Malmstrom, um, it became clear to me that uh, that I wasn't gonna gonna drive this bus really, and uh, and when I when I kind of let go of that and got to that point, you know, which was really a transformational you know experience for me as an educator, when I started to kind of really say, you know what, the project is create a game in Minecraft, you know, you know, run with it, you know, let's see what you come up with. Um, Pedagogically, I mean, I teach game design. I could teach the kids the game design elements. They follow the same iterative design process with Minecraft as they would with any other tool we use. Um, but they're the expert, and I clearly am not, um, which created such an awesome experience in my classroom in terms of, you know, me being a co-learner um, with the kids, allowing the kids to, you know, really guide the process you know, even when it came to things like um, setting up servers, you know, I started with with the uh, Minecraft EDU um, because I could, you know, manage that myself. And then as I realized some of the things the kids wanted that we might need to go outside of that, they offered up their server space and their skills and ultimately taught me just enough to be able to manage what I needed to, to, you know, be an, an admin on the server. And, uh, and that's, you know, and we've been running with it. And Recently, we've been doing a lot with Redstone also and uh, creating a number of tutorials that are now, you know, on our YouTube channel and, and actually at the moment featured on the Minecraft education site. Um, and the kids, now that they're doing that and producing that, they're just coming in every day during lunch and after school, you know, to record their videos and publish them and all that. So it's been, been really exciting. So the product coming out of your classroom, Steve, then really is these student products that they're designing where Minecraft isn't necessarily the thing. It's part of a, a larger kind of learning environment that you're creating. Yeah, correct. So, um, so Bron, when you hear that Steve's been influenced by you, mm -hmm. some of the things you've talked about, how do you, you know, what are you hearing when you hear Steve talk about that? Um, I'm very excited and I know Steve is um, admired by teachers all around the world for his um, classroom practice and his leading use of technology so that's fantastic but just to preface what that was 
um, in massively Minecraft because we weren't restricted, uh, restrained by curriculum, we were able to build a philosophy based on let's see where the kids take this before we look to design anything. Um, and uh, you know, as I've said before, when you, I used to teach pottery, so when you give kids clay, you want them to bash it and beat it and eat it and throw it against the wall and really understand the product that they're working with, the medium that they're working with. And I think we don't build enough space for kids to do that in technology. Um, and so part of Massively Minecraft's philosophy was let the kids do the design. Let's work on participatory design. We asked all the adults that came into the space to be to work as trusted adults, not as the police on the children's space, but to be in there as co-learners. And I think um, you know that philosophy has influenced people like Steve and Marianne, who've just taken it to the next level and brought that philosophy inside a school and proven that you know no one will die, you know, if we don't go in with absolutely strict reins on the curriculum. But the curriculum, sorry for interrupting, uh, the curriculum nowadays, at least um, where we are here in Canada, has a big focus on things like inquiry learning. So even though it may not be, well, we have covered X, Y, and Z, we cover so much more. And you can go deeper. So what, Ron, you said you let the, you let the reins go and you let students co-create with the adults in the environment. Can you give a few examples of what they're creating? And then I'm going to ask everybody else that same question. But w when you're doing this and you're doing that inquiry learning, what are some of the outcomes of that that you get excited about seeing? Um, well, in Massively Minecraft, the kids were building um, games. They built Olympic stadiums when the Olympics were on. Um, they invested a heavy number of hours in those spaces, and parents got to see firsthand what it is kids were engaging in in Minecraft. I don't think you get to see the same thing when you're standing over someone's shoulder watching, but if you're in the space with them and engaging with them, you get a real sense of, of what it is they're, they're playing. Um, I mean, the examples are massive. The kids, we had a um, hundred missions in the space and the kids developed some of those, some of those we developed and the students um, leveled up for responsibility and that was really exciting. Their reward for leveling up in the space was to have greater and greater responsibility um, and to be able to add mods to the system and to take the reins on the server side of, of activity. And I think that's some of the most exciting stuff and as Steve said, he touched on that. Kids, kids want to manage the space, not be managed in the space. What do you mean by missions, Bron? Um, we had a sequence of like a hundred challenges that the kids could do. They didn't have to do any of them and they could build their own tra trajectory through them mm -hmm. um, as they wanted to. So they could start at the very highest number, number 100 if they wanted to, or they could pick their way through lower ones or do none of them. Um, they were there just to give them some ideas of where else they could be taking it um, and some ideas of projects they could be building when they get to Redstone if they needed that and lots of kids didn't because they were inspired with their own ideas, um, but it did give them a, a trajectory they could build and a sense of autonomy in the space. Um, there's nothing lonelier than being in a virtual world by yourself and we saw this a lot in Quest Atlantis, you know, where kids would be saying, I'm bored because it's very much the social space. So we gave them lots of ideas for um, collaborative projects so that they could be working with other people um, rather than just always on an individual level. So if, if, if listeners right now wanted to see some of those missions, are they all on Massively Minecraft? Are they posted there? Or a few of them? Uh, they, I think they are out there somewhere, but you want to contact um, Joe Kay and the um, Massively Jocadia project, and I'm sure she, she'd be happy to share those with you. And most of those Joe did develop, um, the ones that were centrally developed were Joe's work, so um, I would direct you towards her if you wanted to know more about that. Okay. Diana and Denise, what are some of the things that, that students have generated that you as educators are, are wanting to see? Um, and let's, you know, Diana, you had mentioned inquiry-based learning, so what does that look like on the other side of the time that they spend? 
Um, well, the neat thing, Sean, is that um, some of the artifacts, so to speak, you can see them in-game, but some of the things are the conversations that happen outside of game, or the discussions, or the ways that the students incorporate their Minecraft passions into the, into the curriculum. Um, I know Denise has a, a, a fabulous story that we tell all the time, am I correct, Denise, about um, how uh, for some of us it's, it's, yes, what they do in game, but sometimes what they do outside of game. Um, Denise, do you want to share that story? Which one specifically? There's a few. There's my social studies, there's the gender, there's um, letters. What What would you like to hear, Sean? <laughs> Boy, out of those three, I'd have to pick social studies. But okay. So this was one of those... This is one of those ones where this was not intentionally an outcome of what we were doing. So we were having a class inquiry on uh, what are wants and needs. So for the first few weeks that they were in Minecraft, they were in the creative mode. A creative mode being they have all the pieces of that of the game and they can have as many as they want. And then after a while, I said, "Okay, so we're going to the needs, and you can't." You, you must play in survival mode where you have to earn everything through mining and hunting and gathering. And from that I got some great uh, language responses, um, graphic details of um, graphic organizers of all the ways they died mm -hmm. and so on. Fast forward to our social studies lesson where we're talking about the differences between Champlain and Cartier. Um, Cartier having failed to set up a settlement and Champlain having succeeded and my students were unable to make the connection as to why one failed and one succeeded. Banging my head against the wall I finally just went okay look think of Minecraft. What happened when you first got into survival mode and they told me about all the times they started dying and how many times they died. And I said okay well are you successful now? And they say, yeah, we, we decided that we would work together. So some of us build, some of us mine, some of us protect the group, some of us, and then it was like all these light bulbs went off. And like, <gasps> Champlain brought farmers, he brought soldiers, he brought, and that's where the connections were made. And that was totally not the connection I wanted them to, like I planned on that connection being made, but through the free play experience that they had, we were able to unpack it and connect it back to the curriculum. So that was one of my really powerful yay moments. <laughs> well, and, and so, you know what's fascinating is I think sometimes when we think of games and learning at all, we think of the digital and the glowing screen. And for so many teachers and educators I talk to, like Bron really tuned me into this. It's not what happens in the screen. It's that converse, that's that common language that you now speak with your students. And that can go in any direction in a lot of different subject areas. I think that's really fascinating, and that's a good story about that. Um, we'll have to get Bron to talk about how they made like a social contract, too, if you want to tell that story later, Bron. But first, Steve, what are some of the things that the students have created out of this co-creational space? Also, uh, the references... <coughs> To, uh, the missions and massively. It looks like Peggy George and Joe K posted those in the Q and A <laughs> section. So for those of you on a reference or find those links, they're, they're posted now. Steve, how about you? So, so I mean, gosh, a lot. Um, you know, it, it evolves each year as like it, and looks differently. Um, one of the things, and I posted a link to this in the uh, in the chat or in the tweet Twitter sphere. Um, I had two kids last year that created a game called Cart Wreck. And, you know, what I'm trying to do a lot is video, you know, them kind of talking through their games and actually have the kids do some of that themselves too. But um, it was really fascinating to watch these kids uh, show me their game and talk through it. And if people get a chance, I'd love for them to watch the video because at the surface, you know, at front you see this game. It's called Cart Wreck. The kids are, it, you know, it's a it's a game where you're shooting arrows at mine carts that are going around, kind of like a carnival type mini game. And so basically, you shoot a cart. You, you know, a redstone lamp lights up. You get points. Eventually, if you get enough carts, you win. And it indicates that if all the carts, you know, go away, you lose. So you know, looking at it, it looks pretty cool. Then the kids uh, take us. <laughs> 
then the kids take us behind the scenes, and um, you know, I start talking to them about how you know clearly they must have used redstone for this. So they take us around the back of the uh, of this thing, and it's this you know ridiculous um, amount of redstone to to make this whole thing work. And they're explaining it to me, and I'm just like blown away because they're talking about how they needed you know the dispensers to to release the carts and the carts if they go all the way. Through, you know, they go, they're redstone powered, and if they get hit down, it lights this redstone, which triggers this, which triggers that, and I mean, it's just this this incredible, um, you know, you know, <laughs> thing, and it's, it's just really neat to see when you go around the back and the kids start explaining how they did this. So, um, on that note, um, allowing the kids to reflect on the experience and actually talk about how they did what they did, um, and I love having that dialogue because <laughs> my my clueless nature that I sometimes show in my questioning to them is is very genuine um, because some of the things they're doing, I mean, I could not possibly recreate. Uh, so there's a lot of that. Um, there have been some neat collaborations of of students. I had um, kind of a neat story last year. I had a, a group of you know the kids can work in groups as small or as large as they like, which is actually one of the things I like so much about Minecraft is that um, I sometimes call it the Google Docs of game design, um, you know, tools. Uh, it's the only tool I've found so far where kids, you know, as many kids as you want can collaborate in real time without diffusion of responsibility, without one kid talking to the other group over there because they're, you know, because other people are doing the work for them. And the way they're delegating responsibility and taking leadership roles and all this is, is just amazing how that, you know, kind of takes its own form. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the, so, so I had one project starting last year and I had two girls working together and they were enjoying, you know, they were enjoying Minecraft just fine. They had never really played before. It was definitely a new experience. They were committed to making this game but really didn't, um, you know, understand these things like redstone and things like that. Um, I happen to have a, a student who is, you know, autistic and happens to be incredible at Minecraft and wanted to actually work with a group. So what I, I asked the whole class, you know, I, I explained how, what this kid's skill set was and how valuable he could be. Um, you know, is there a group that would like to work with him? And, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But these two girls' hands shot up. And immediately this team formed that, um, you know, ended up being fantastic. He became the leader. He knew the, the nuts and bolts, the inners, you know, of, um, of Minecraft. And he was able to kind of do all of the, like, coding and putting all that together. And, and then he was able to delegate to them. And they were so content and happy and pleased to be, you know, building parts of the game that were going to connect but um, but also allowing him to take, you know, on the role that was was clearly what he was good at. So you see a lot of just interesting things. Uh, you know, uh, one last one I'll kind of say uh, that I notice a lot is kids in my class will be working on their game, and they'll ask if, if their friend who's not in my class can contribute to their game, and the answer is of course. So you get kids that create this you know, tremendous ship that's going to be where the zombies spawn in this game. And I mean, it's like a work, you know, a work of art. And here's a kid who's not taking the class, not getting a grade, not getting credit. And those are the kinds of things, you know, you see, you know, all the time. Pretty wild. So, so Minecraft is a server-based game. Of course, you can have multiple players jump into the game at the same time. And one of the questions in the Q&A is about for, for all of your programs, do you open it up to anyone? Bron already talked about how she wanted parents to be in the game, um, but are, are these servers where you whitelist them or only allow your own students into them? Or can, Steve, when you did that, did you whitelist in their friends? Or do you have servers that are kind of open? That's a great question. Um, so some of them, if it was a server that one of the kids set up their own server, which happened quite a bit, then they might allow the kid onto their server because that's where they're creating their game. Um, one really neat thing, and I'm glad you brought this up, um, Lucas Gillespie, who you know a lot of people out there know, I think he's even, I saw him tweeting a little bit before. Um, Lucas was kind enough a few years ago, we had been talking about creating a server in, 
and it was probably based off the model of, of um, massively Minecraft, but our idea was let's get a place for educators and students to play together. So that server, you do have to be whitelisted on. Any group of students that are going to enter, you know, have a, a teacher at least that's sort of um, their sponsor, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we welcome others because we want to grow that community. And right now, you know, it's it's kids from my school in New Jersey, a lot of kids from North Carolina. He moved school districts, so he has kids from his other district in there. But um, I'd encourage anybody, you know, that's watching today to reach out to us. Um, it's also a neat place. I have teachers all the time asking me, you know, how do I play? You know, I'd love to play with <laughs> other teachers. So. You know, let's get um, more of that happening. And it's so it is. It's a. I like there. To, I mean, there's a. It's a safe environment, but it is open. Um, Braun mentioned early the 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 importance of it being a social game. You can't take that away from kids. Um, I do personally have reservations myself sometimes in school about them just going to any server. So I, you know, kind of allow them on the Edu Realm server, which is the server Lucas created and a few other places, um, certainly the servers that we create ourselves, but it, um, it provides just that, that safe, but yet, like Bron also said, it's not a bunch of teachers monitoring, you know, I mean, monitoring on a very lightweight scale, but, but not kind of making it feel like the kids are being watched, but rather playing together, and that's a crucial part of it. Does Can it? I buy in on that? Just yeah, sure. uh, yeah, I just want to say two things um, on that issue of trusted adults. Um, Dana Boyd has done a lot of work in this space and says that kids learn best in spaces with trusted adults. Um, so they don't want to necessarily be on their own um, on a Minecraft server. They want to have their teachers and other people involved, but they don't want you there to tell them what to do or how to do it or to police their behaviour. And being a trusted adult is quite a different role. Um, but you can have a lot of fun and teachers have to let go of that hierarchy of the classroom when they step into that role in the space with kids. Mm -hmm. And the second thing Steve touched on that I think is vital if you're going to run a 24-7 server or an open server or any kind of server really is the notion of investing in building community. Um, and I think that's vitally important in having the kids vested in their space and they become the ones who manage the space, who um, moderate behaviour and they're the ones who will um, tell people we don't behave like that in here, you know. Um, you need to invest in that building community and I saw that in a beautiful way in uh, Peggy Sheehy's class. I was lucky enough to be there, um, I think it's 18 months ago now and her year eights had decided, or grade eights had decided they wanted to set up a Minecraft server and leave it as a legacy for the kids that came after them as they moved on to high school. And um, so Peggy said, well, take it from the top. You write a proposal to the principal and, and explain why you would want Minecraft in the school and what, what would be the benefits. And then they had to work with the IT supervisor to set up the server. So they had management rights on the server. Um, and then they worked with other kids to build a, um, a focus group to design the first charter for the community. Um, and so they looked at other servers around the world that people had charters and then they modified and massaged it till they got one that they wanted for their school that they thought was appropriate. Um, and this was, these were pretty savvy kids, so they'd visited quite a few Minecraft servers themselves, so they knew what they did and they didn't like and the kinds of behaviours they felt should be supported and, and ones that shouldn't. Um, and I was just gobsmacked at how, in, how mature their reasoning and their conversation was in this space. So as Steve said, if you can hand the reins over to them for those aspects of it, um, and invest in building a community, you really will um, have far less problems in terms of um, mean-spirited behaviour or bullying or other things that can happen. But on that note, I would say they are children and they will. there will be occasions where they do misbehave or have a bad day and blow up in the space or whatever, and we have to remember that and treat it as the teachable moment that it is. 
to talk it through with kids and discuss why it may not be the best behavior or the best way to approach something. It sounds like when I hear you talk about it, Brian, that you're thinking of the digital space like a community and that there's that you're, you're empowering your students to be civically minded students by giving that community some of the reins of that community over to your students and through the contract that they help create. But that actually te teaches them to be citizens in face-to-face -face environments too. Have you seen any evidence of that? I know we um, have. Uh, we definitely yeah, go ahead. have. Uh, over in the, sorry Broad, I don't mean to uh, steal away your, your question there, uh, mm -hmm. but I know definitely in the gaming and use environment, we've had several examples where um, they bleed together, where learning how to behave appropriately in the virtual environment helps them learn how to behave appropriately in the regular environment. And if it's okay, Sean, I just wanted to go back and mention that over with the Gaming Edus, um, which is www.gamingedus.org, we also have two servers. We have a professional play server, because I, I love what Stephen Bronwood were saying, that adults need to play too. So we have a professional play server where adults can come and play Minecraft. They are not with their students uh, because sometimes adult play is a little bit different than, than student or child play. Um, and some of our adult players are a little bit nervous when they're experimenting. Um, it, inquiry can be a little bit scary for them. So, And we even have Tuesday evening play and learn sessions. Uh, we used to, I'm not sure if we still do this, Denise, even lend out Minecraft accounts so that uh, adults can come and try it for themselves at their own pace. They can differentiate their own learning. Um, and we've also got a multi-school server. And similar to uh, Steve's, um, our uh, schools come from all over, actually North America, Canada and the U.S. We've got um, players from all over, and it's wonderful to see how they interact with each other um, and, and to get the, it, it's just very powerful. So Diana, so so, roughly speaking, how many schools are you connecting together in that one server? It um, that's a great question, um, Sean. It depends on the day. Um, we've got <laughs> uh, because there will be days where it's just one school. We've got days where it'll be four and five schools, okay. and uh, we've got portals where they can go to their own area. But we've also got shared building spaces and shared community spaces and even a shared PvP arena too. So, um, because gameplay involves so many things, not just building. Oh, and thank you. Denise has pointed out to me that we actually have 17 different schools. Um, and we've also got some public library spaces too uh, that use our multi-school server, which is supported by Ryerson University, Edge Lab. All right, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to a question that I know you've all heard, but I'm asking it in part because I know you all have answers to this question. What do you say to a parent or an administrator that says, you know, this, the Minecraft play thing is a, it, it, are you worried that that might be a big waste of time? And some of you have kind of hinted at how you might answer that, that there's other things going on outside of the game that you like, but how, how do you answer that in a really succinct way, any any of you? Sean, I'm going to jump in just really quickly and say um, the question I get, that, which is kind of a twist on that, is parents saying, my kids play hours and hours of Minecraft at home, why should they do it at school? And that's probably the bigger question that we as educators have to be able to clearly answer. Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, I, the social space of Minecraft is vital and so for me it's that lived curriculum of digital citizenship of you know of, of having kids learn and experience how to live in this digital world in a way that's positive and safe and so digital citizenship is a great entree for parents they understand the need for it and it's a good way for them to to engage with it because when kids are playing at home or on other servers they don't have necessarily those trusted adults. And so I think that's a great answer. But the other thing is, even if we're working, as Diana said, in a very open-ended play space, we know what the, um, the outcomes or standards are that we're hitting with that work. And we need to be able to identify that to parents. I mean, uh, as a parent, I wouldn't want my kids doing something 
that they were doing hours and hours of at home if it looked exactly the same kind of play in the classroom. So I think we really do have to be able to articulate what it is in the curriculum, but I don't think it needs to be a roadmap um, for engagement. Right. If I could um, add to that too, the um, it's one of those things sometimes, I mean, you also kind of want to say the fact that they're playing for hours at home might be exactly why we do want to bring it into the classroom. Um, this is where the kids are. You know, we could definitely um, be in their world um, and, and and then, but absolutely, the part about, you know, where does it fit in? I mean, in my case, it's great because one of the, the big learning outcomes in any project my kids do deals with the iterative design process. We go through the same exact process using Minecraft, and if that's the tool these kids are going to use, it's fantastic. And, and then, take it a step further, in my environment, they're taking things, um, you know, a lot further in terms of coding you know, and, and automating things and taking it from, you know, an, an area where they're used to, you know, playing or often at home I think kids are, are very much going to servers and playing the games that are on servers like the Hunger Games and all these other uh, mods and things on servers and now that's perfect inspiration for them to take with them to create their own and then see that process through. But in terms of unpacking and deconstructing what somebody else has done, it's a tremendous learning opportunity. So, uh, you know. Diana, Denise, anything to add? Denise, you go ahead. I've been kind of talking a lot from uh, up north here. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, I guess when, te when parents have come to me about that, I really, it, this goes to the assessment piece. Um, when I've chosen Minecraft explicitly for something, I know what I'm assessing before. Like, I've planned it out, so I can usually point to the curriculum expectations. So I can explain why building a bridge in Minecraft is a much richer learning activity than building it with popsicle sticks. Talking about the reasoning beyond, uh, behind building materials and just the richness of that activity and how it further goes into the curriculum expectations. Um, also going to the learning skills, being able to foster the collaboration within. Um, and also when you're talking about language and writing, a lot of my students have been very inspired by their gameplay. So doing creative writing or even procedural writing um, with the use of the game as uh, leveraging the game in that way leads to a richer writing piece than some standard prompts. So there's a lot of, if, if you have a firm grasp on the curriculum and you have that end, the planning with the end in mind, mm -hmm. that should be an easy question to answer. And kids who usually or typically don't always achieve a lot of success in school are, and, and I think it was Steve that mentioned about that, that student who was on the spectrum, Steve, am I correct? and who is a whiz at Minecraft, some of the kids, this is their entry. This is their chance to shine. And if we can bring something into school where they can shine, and they can show that they are just as smart as the other kids, why aren't we doing it more? Yeah, Steve's applauding with his mic, mic off right there. So, All right, let me transition a little bit. We have about 20 minutes left, and I really, you know, uh, we're talking about kind of this innovative use of a wonderful kind of gaming experience, but you've all mentioned a lot of different ways that you've used it um, with your students or, or even had your students using it with you. Um, the question that I want to go to next is about evaluation. So mm -hmm. assessment, evaluation, and I'm talking, and, and I'm defining that very broadly. So I'm not just talking about how do you give your multiple choice tests around a piece of content, but all of these things that you've named as valuable, how do you know that they're happening with students and how do you in any way, shape, or form do either formative or summative evaluation around this use of Minecraft for learning? I, I could start. Um, the, you know, again, this is where, and, and I think it was what um, Denise was mentioning earlier, is as educators we know what our learning outcomes are, right? So it's it's how are we going to get there? Um, 
in my case, so I, I teach a quest-based uh, quest approach where kids have a lot of choice in their learning pathways. Um, however, and I said it before as well, but if the kids are creating a game, they're going through a process that's assessed regardless of the tool. So the first step is typically them creating a, a comprehensive design document. It's part of the design planning phase of any game. Um, so they create that. It, it includes narrative, storyline, character descriptions, the rules set for the game, how they plan to accomplish this, you know, what challenges they anticipate, things like that. So they start there. Then they build a playable prototype of their game, um, again, regardless of the tool. Then they have people test their game, give feedback, and the iterative process goes on. They uh, Then they iterate with that feedback, improve upon their game, develop it further, and ultimately submit for me, you know, at one stage, a playable prototype, which is assessed as either, you know, complete or not. Mm -hmm. And then some kids then have an opportunity, because it's a choice-based system, to stop at that point and move to something else, or they continue to a point that their game is able to be published to a to a true audience where others can download their game, play their game, and that they've really, you know, delivered a complete product. So that's like another phase of that. Um, so, how so that's one students feedback during are you kind of just oh, yeah. as they're building, you're kind of by their side and you're just giving them verbal feedback or how do you give them feedback on what they're designing? There are there are checkpoints for sure. Um, Kids, you know, kids love to call me over to try different parts. That's easy. Uh, one thing I always remind kids is when somebody's testing their game, um, they need to sit back and, you know, keep their mouth closed and, and, and watch and understand the user experience and see if people are playing the way they intended. Um, for a game to really function as a game, the player needs to be able to play the game without the, without the developer, um, you know, there all the time. So there's a piece of it there. Um, but they're also, be, with every, like what I love about, see I use 3D Game Lab, and when kids submit a quest, if they submit their design document, I provide feedback, they get it back, it's either accepted because it's worthy of being accepted, or they get suggestions and they continue to work on it with, you know, so that's like a typical, you know, like a, you know, a writing piece, and then once that's accepted, and they have certain checkpoints where they submit their game and get you know, direct feedback from me, and probably more importantly, the checkpoints where their peers evaluate and give feedback on their games. Um, but but each but because of the the quest based system, as as you know, because I know you use some the same thing, Sean. Is you know you get to scaffold the, the the experience, and I can have points where it's like, okay, you know, this point, this is what's expected, and this is how you proceed from here. And once we've gone through a bit of feedback there, if necessary. They have that accepted, and then they know what's next. So um, that's the way it works typically in my class. And the reflection piece from kids is so important. When I have them do a project like one of these redstone builds or their game, each thing that they submit comes with them responding to very um, detailed like reflection questions. I want to hear from them that they understand what they did, how they did it, what they learned, and that they can explain that to me. And if so, then I, I can. That's a way to assess their learning. Sure. I, and I want to buy in on the end of that comment about reflection because Jim G describes the the hard the software of the game, the medium that we're in, as the small G, and then that, as Diana said, suggested the conversation, the activity that builds out from that, the spaces that it ekes out into are uh, the big G and that's where the powerful stuff is happening and I think um, I, I pick up on um, Dan Hickey at Indiana University has done a lot of work on uh, learning motivation uh, recognition and assessment and, and he says we should be focusing more on the reflection on learning because that's where the powerful statements are and learning how to, how to support and scaffold students to reflect on their tasks and their building because the spaces I work in, it's less about what they built in Minecraft or designed in Minecraft and more about the conversation that is happening, about the social space, about the reflection on learning, um, it, whether that's a role play on democracy in the space. Um, those powerful reflections that still children are writing will give you 
absolutely the evidence of learning. Um, and so they may be written tasks, they may be tasks that, that, that are totally outside of the actual game. Um, and teachers know how to do that. They know how to craft those kinds of tasks. But I think we need to realise that even in adult learning, we need to focus more on reflection on the task than on the actual completion or product of the task. That's, so for you, Bron, really the question is what is learning? And, and at that point, educators already have some talent in how to do reflection around learning, but the question is what exactly are we doing? What's of value to us in those kinds of learning spaces? Is that a, am I hearing you right on that? Ab absolutely. And I mean, I, I, I looked at a teacher at um, the Elizabeth Morrow School um, a year ago teaching democracy where she runs a role play and the kids the first year ran a dictatorship and in the second year a monarchy and there's a revolution and they all hate the unfair practices and the day I was actually at the school they assassinated the queen and the peasants took over the land um, and that's a lived experience of, of democracy um, coming to democracy uh, because they're learning about revolution. But the interesting thing was they play like 20 minutes twice a week and they write a reflection on their play in the role, in the story, not the play in Minecraft, but the play in the role. Mm -hmm. And they're not allowed to play the next session if they haven't written their reflections. But she doesn't have to force them. The reflections are really powerful work coming from the kids and show that they understand what led to, um, to democracy in their little community. And they only play this for five weeks. So it's not like it's a giant unit, but they're living out the experiences that led to democracy in the United States in a game and reflecting on it. Excellent, Bronwyn, just excellent. Okay. Diana and, and, and or Denise, in, as you have worked together, are there particular ways that you evaluate the value of the experience? I think really the important thing to mention, and Diana and I, along with Jen Apgar, um, have talked a lot when we've done workshop is workshops are that Minecraft is, sent, is a tool. You don't assess a pencil. It's how you use the tool that determines what you assess. Um, we could be using Minecraft as the provocation for an assignment. So, or you could be using it as the building materials for an assignment, um, but it's not Minecraft you are assessing. So, it's it's really the reflection piece. It's really the um, the student thinking, uh, and and I think that's what Bronwyn was really getting at. And Diana, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> Um, just to mention that we do have some public examples of student reflection in action, actually. Um, we have a wiki called the Minecraft Club Hub, .pbworks.com, and um, the students write, uh, to respect their privacy, they use their game names, but they, um, and this one is once again more for the club than for the school or the academic reign, but because we're running it in a school, um, we were focusing on encouraging literacy, numeracy, and social skills, and you can read what the kids write about their discovery, their own discoveries. And the neat thing is, it's these uh, wiki reflections aren't marked. But let me tell you, I have never seen so much writing from some of these kids who usually we have to pry sentences out of them. Right. They won't stop. <laughs> they won't stop, Sean. You Pages know, bigger than your book, <laughs> Sean. <laughs> Sean, can I just jump in there and add, we, yeah. should be really, we should be really wary of any teacher saying, I do Minecraft, <laughs> because you, it's not... It, it, it's very much what was just said by Denise, it's not the tool. You, and it, when teachers say, yeah, we do Minecraft, that, that's very much the wrong thing. If they say, we do digital citizenship with Minecraft, that's another story. But we should be very wary of teachers saying, I do Minecraft, because I don't. that's very much the wrong perspective. So let me ask this, and I, and I already uh, uh, gave Bron an advance notice on this. To some degree, 
maybe teachers should be doing more things like Minecraft to, to change their own perception around teaching and learning and what it looks like. Um, so initially, Brian, when you first set up what you do, you work with a lot of teacher training, and you're working with that. In my own work with pre-service teachers, I work with teachers that sometimes technology can be a roadblock. How they think about teaching and learning can kind of be the roadblock we just got done talking about. And um, so what are some things about, so if we want people to not think of like, I do Minecraft or I do a tool, what do they do? What's the positive side of that? Um, how would, what are the kinds of things that we're looking for teachers to do where Minecraft might be part of their, their learning ecology or how they set it up? That's such oh, that's such a big question. Such a big question. Pedagogy. Um, what let me say when I, I've run I've run missions in 3D game lab on Minecraft, and the ones that are learning about Minecraft, the teachers engage in fully. The ones that involve them meeting up in the space to actually play, mm -hmm. they're hesitant about doing. And, um, and I think engaging teachers, you want to run PD face-to-face, -face, sit with them, you know, handhold as much as you can. And don't make this mistake of bringing kids in to teach them because I've seen this okay. over and over. They are intimidated by the massive expertise of the children mm -hmm. and they, they really need their own space for this learning. Once they've got a little bit under their belt, then by all means they want to learn from the kids. But I think that first <coughs> entree to Minecraft needs to be teachers on their own, and I've seen Lucas Gillespie run fabulous PD for his teachers in uh, is it Cook County, where, where Lucas is. I always get the counties wrong in North Carolina. But, but bring teachers together and, and have a laugh, you know, have a cup of tea and some biscuits and, okay. you know, and make it fun for them to jump into the space. And then I think you've, you, there's a hurdle they have to jump and they have to do that together. Uh, let me ask in a little different way too to just because I you have so much that you have to say about this. So let's say we had a workshop with teachers using where we brought Minecraft into that workshop. Maybe the teachers are never going to use Minecraft in the classroom. Are there things they have to learn pedagogically by playing a game like Minecraft? <laughs> Valuing the teaching <laughs> Look at the hands. Hands are going up. So uh, Denise, um, I think. For me, and this is a bugaboo, I think, for both me and Diana, um, we really like to drive home the idea of games-based learning. So sort of like it's akin to play-based learning um, where you bring the game alongside. It's not gamification where we're putting a game's layer onto everything. It's <laughs> where we're coming alongside with a game that might hit on what we're teaching. So it could be Minecraft. It could be a card game. But the pedagogy of playing to help engage the learner and get deeper um, grasp of content material or go deeper in discussion on social issues that are brought into the classroom even. So that idea of the games-based learning. One thing um, that I find incredibly powerful with Minecraft in particular um, is, is, how, is, is using it as a means to see how kids learn. Um, I continually find myself sharing with people the fact that, you know, Minecraft came with no instruction manual. Um, all of the content out there about how to play this game is user generated. I mean, it, it, it's it is honestly a phenomenon, and 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 demonstrating that. And if you've ever seen, like, you know, and I always look at my daughter at home. Both my daughters, you know, they learn from YouTube, right? They go right to YouTube. They learn what they need to learn. I don't care if it's my daughter doing stuff on Rainbow Loom, and I see her, you know, like meticulously following along and whatever, and then they become creators as well because they want to now create content. So, you know, they, if it's YouTube, they then want to teach others. So, I mean, I even with my students have them creating tutorials in Minecraft to show others how to do things, but they're contributing to that ecosystem, which is, is incredible, and, and I find it so interesting that the way they're learning in informal spaces is like, like, you know, they're learning. They're learning more than they're learning in school. And then we bring them into school and we want them to 
to do school, you know, like people say, and and why don't we merge those two worlds? And that's one thing that we can all learn from from this game in particular, probably from many other games, and from just you know understanding where our kids are and what works for them. And this game just exemplifies that. I think in terms, and then Ron can maybe speak to requests too, but. You know, over the last 10 years, I've taken these long 20-point step instructional guides, which are considered great instructional design, but then I get 150 projects that look identical. And instead of doing that, paring down that instructional design to a single quest, leaving the parameters a bit more flexible, I'll get 150 brilliant projects from these kids that really think differently about the problem. And to some degree, I think that's a pedagogical challenge as we train teachers, right? How do we get teachers to understand what you're describing, Steve? Is this, there is an informal learning, and there are ways to encourage that, or even proctor or foster that space, but there are, you, you have to back off on some of that highly structured instructional design that you might be tempted to do. So, Bron, did you have more to add to that thought? Yeah, only I was going to say it's about the bigger question of inquiry learning and project-based project, project -based learning rather than Minecraft. You know, it's adopting a pedagogy which Minecraft uh, affords. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Minecraft itself has a pedagogy, um, but I think it affords um, some of what we really aspire to in, um, in, in child student-driven learning and um, student articulation of learning. So I think... It's more about um, that. And I think we do need to challenge teachers to learn more like kids and not keep giving them the manual and the, and the, you know, the handouts and say, okay, if you wanted to know this, if you were a 10-year-old, how would you find it out? How would you work out how to do it? And get them engaging more in the way their students do. Um, to go to YouTube, to understand how to do it, to follow the instructions, to work that way. Um, and, and diversify their own learning. Yeah. I think we have to build some bridges because for some that's going to be, Bronwyn, what you're describing is exciting, but for some it's so scary. Okay. And that's why, but what? No instruction manual? No textbook? And then the, the answers in the back? But that's why I think we can build bridges. For instance, I really admired when you said, um, uh, and respected Bronwyn about, you know, don't have the children come in because they're going to scare the pants off of some of these teachers. But then I loved how Stephen said about contributing to the group knowledge by making their own YouTube videos and instructional videos. Um, mm -hmm. And the Gaming Edu server, the professional play server, we found that new teachers were like, but I don't know what to do. So some of the students or some of the kid players on the professional play server, the students or young people who play are actually children and relatives of the teachers. They created a differentiated um, choose your own adventure way to learn Minecraft if that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. And so that way they could choose to explore, but for some of them who are still a little bit concerned about taking that big jump without the parachute, there was this little path, and it, it's gorgeous. We'll have to post some screenshots because they're colored paths. So you can still choose what path you want to go, but if you're scared of walking in the woods without a path, oh my goodness, look at this analogy. You still have a path, and we can still help you. Um, we are out of time, so I want to thank everyone for the conversation and uh, your willingness to share uh, with all of our the, the folks listening and, and to have this recorded. Again, the Twitter hashtags for this is hashtag connected learning and CCAMPS, so connected camps. Uh, there's going to be a full recording of this webinar immediately on connected learning TV, uh, connected learning .tv, um, and uh, you're welcome to share it with others. The Twitter channel has been going crazy, so that conversation will probably continue for a while. And you can find it there. But I want to thank everyone for coming and sharing your stories with us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could talk yes, for thank hours. Yes, this is delightful. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, really. Totally. Got to bring this group back together sometime. <laughs>